section of the chapter and that way we will try to get a sense of that chapter as well as a sense of the flow of what is happening in the Bhagavad Gita. So let's begin with the first chapter, first verse. The Gita begins with Let's just, so I tell the meaning, and if you know some of the verses, but still it's good to understand the meaning and then we'll recite it. So the way we'll, do, we'll try to do this is, we will, I tell the meaning, we'll recite each line, understanding the meaning first, and then we'll recite the whole words. So the thrashtra uvacha, it's straightforward, uvacha is to speak. So uvacha, uvacha is to speak, uvacha is to emit or to bring about its speech. So he says, Dharma Kshetre Kurukshetre. That on that place of Dharma, which is known as Kurukshetra. So, Dharma Kshetre Kurukshetre. Dharma Kshetre Kurukshetre. Samaveta. Samaveta means assembled. They are assembled for what purpose? Yudsava. For the purpose of fighting. Samaveta Yudsavaha Samaveta Yudsavaha Mamakaha My my people It is my sons And Pandavas Chaiva The sons of Pandu Both of them have assembled over there Mamakaha Pandavas Chaiva Mamakaha Pandavas Chaiva Kim Akurvata Kim means what? Akurvata Kurvata That comes from the word Kuru Karma, what do they have in Hindi? Do. What did they do? Kim Akurvata Sanjay. Uh, he is asking this question to his assistant Sanjay. Who is his eyes? Uh, and uh, eyes and basically ears for understanding what is happening on the battlefield. Primarily the eyes. But he is asking him, Kim Akurvata Sanjay. Kim Akurvata Sanjay. So let us recite this once together. Dhritarashtra Vacha Dharma Kshetre Guru Kshetre Samaveta Yusava Mamaka Pandava Shaiva Kimha Gurvata Sanjaya Thank you. So here, the Bhagavad Gita has how many chapters anyone knows? 18 chapters. And how many verses? 700. 700 verses. Yes, I just mentioned that. So, 
Now, out of these, the first chapter has 46 verses. And the first chapter is more or less setting the scene. The Gita as a conversation can be understood at broadly three levels. The Gita conversation it is first of all a conversation between Krishna and Arjuna and that has not yet begun. Then at a bigger level the Gita is spoken as a conversation between Sanjay and Dhritarashtra. That is what has begun right now with Dhritarashtra's question. This comes in 1.1. So this is 1.1 to 18.78. The core discussion between Krishna and Arjuna actually begins with 82.7 and ends in 18.73. Uh, now before that there is some discussion that happens but we will come to that. Now beyond this, these are two levels of discussion. Now at another level, so this is, you could say the Gita is a historical conversation. So historical means what happened at a particular time in history. But beyond that, the Gita is also meant to be a conversation <coughs> between the Paramatma and the Atma. So ultimately, the Gita, this level conversation is an eternal conversation. So what we want to do is not just study the Gita, but by studying the Gita, we understand that we as the soul Atma are there in our hearts and the Paramatma, Krishna, is there in our hearts. Even our body is like a chariot. And within this, our Lord is present. So as we study the Gita, as we internalize the Gita, the Gita will become a part of us. And just as the words that Krishna spoke to Arjuna, those words at the right time will come to us. They will start manifesting in our heart, giving us guidance and helping us make healthier decisions. Just as the Gita helped Arjuna make a healthy decision. So, we are right now at this second level of the conversation. So, this is spoken. Where is this conversation happening? No, this conversation, second level conversation. Yes, correct. So, the locations are the Krishna and Arjuna conversation is in Kurukshetra. The Sanjay Dhritarashtra conversation is in Astinam. So when this conversation is happening, he is asking, the Dhritarashtra is asking Sanjay what happened? And the Gita starts with this narrative frame. You know, sometimes in a movie, the action can start right where the maybe the hero meets the heroine. Or it can start with a background. You know, there is this family over here and this family over here. And these families are our enemies. And then when that build up happens, and then when the hero and heroine meet, and then any relationship with them is doomed right from the beginning. So sometimes we can start right from the heart of the action and then give a background. Sometimes we may give the background and then come to the heart of the action. So both ways are there. Sometimes there's a gradual build up. So the Gita is building up. And why this building up is going to happen, it's also going to be revealed as we move forward. But it starts with this outer conversation that Dhritarashtra is asking. And the first word that Dhritarashtra speaks is what? Dharma. It's Dharma Kshetra, but even then that, if you consider that to be a compound word, the first word is Dharma. And the whole Gita is Dharmim Samvadam Avayo. It is a question about dharma. Now, what is the meaning of dharma? That itself is a big question. And the Gita, at least uh, seven or eight meanings of the word dharma come in the Gita itself. We'll discuss them as they come. But in this context, when he's using the word dharma, he is using that 
as an adjective. Hmm. Dharma can be a noun. What up, nowadays the word dharma is used in terms of religion. So it is a so it is a dharma kya hai we ask. What is a religion? So there dharma is a noun. But here when it begins, dharma kshetra. Dharma kshetra kuru kshetra. So the kshetra is is the you could say the noun. And the describer of the kshetra is dharma. dharma. It's not that simple. Actually, yes. It's Dharma Kshetra is also a describer of Kurukshetra. So you could say it like uh, if somebody says, hey, uh, that is a elegant door. So door is the noun, elegant is the describer, the adjective. But that is a antique wood elegant door so antique wood is a description of the door but wood is a description of the content antique is not the door antique is the wood so basically it starts with dharma kshetra as an adjective describing guru kshetra this place now why would he begin with this the central inquiry is a war is going to happen over there and actually he wants to know what happened in the war Ultimately, he wants to know who is winning, who won. So, say if a cricket match is going on and we are somewhere where we can't watch the cricket match, we can't get the news. So, you ask someone, hey, what is the score? That's what we would want to know. But, if we knew, for example, that the rain is going likely over there and rain may either cancel the match or curtail the match, then we may say, in that rainy place, where the match is happening, what happened when the teams came to play? <laughs> Isn't it? So, if the biggest concern for somebody is, is the match going to happen or not? Then the first thing they will say, in that rainy place. Isn't it? So, it's like that, Dharma Kshetra is like the rainy place for a cricket match. What that means is, that is the concern in his mind. So, that what happens for a match? The rain can cancel the match, rain can change the trajectory of the match. So his fear is that this dharma, how is it going to influence? So dharma kshetre kuru kshetre samaveta yudsava. They came for fighting. So like in that rainy place, when they came to play the match, what did they do? Now, in one sense, you are already answering the question. They have come to fight and what did they do? If they came to fight, they would fight. That seems to be a straightforward answer. It's uh, See, when somebody asks a stupid question, uh, stupid is a stupid word to describe it, a question whose answer seems to be obvious. Hmm? If somebody asks a question whose answer seems to be obvious, either the questioner is stupid or the the person who is supposed to answer the question is stupid that they don't understand the unspoken question in the question. Isn't it? So there is something more going on over there. If they can, if say some terrorists have put a bomb in a hotel and then they know that that bomb is a time bomb and they, they want it to explode when all the guests have assembled and they are about to eat the food. So then they ask that when everybody sat down, everybody came to eat in the kitchen, what did they do? <laughs> Duh, they ate. That would be the obvious answer. But the question is, did the bomb explode? Did they all run away? Did somebody warn them beforehand? Did they not come in over there? So, there is here basically, there is an unspoken question that is more important then the spoken question. So that is greater than, more important. The question is, what did they do? That is the spoken question. So the unspoken question is, how were they influenced by the place of dharma? By dharma. Now, dharma is virtue, sacred, holy. 
So in that holy place, how were they influenced? So that is his question. And Sanjay is intelligent enough to understand that question. That's why now his concern is that the war is going to happen. How will that dharma influence? So basically, now dharma broadly you could say it's piety, sanctity, uh, spirituality, holiness. This is a holy place. So now his concern is that primarily how is it going to influence Duryodhana? To some extent, Dhritarashtra himself knows that Duryodhana is on the choice of, on the side of Adharma. So Dhritarashtra is concerned how would that place influence Duryodhana? That is his question. And he's worried, would that weaken him? Would that lead him to not fighting? Now, it could affect in many different ways. Maybe in the place of Dharma would weaken Duryodhana's will to fight. Maybe it would weaken Yudhishthira's will to fight, because he may think we should not fight. So he wants to know what happened over there. So he starts with Duryodhana. And that's why the next verse goes to Duryodhana. And what does he say? Duryodhan saw Drishtva to Pandavani come Yudhan Duryodhan Astada Achari Mupasangamya Raja Vachinam Abravit. So he says that on that battlefield, so there were the Kauravas on one side, the Pandavas on the other side. So right now, the camera's focus is on the Kauravas. So he starts with here, Duryodhan is on his chariot and what he does is, he immediately goes to the chariot of Drona. Now next to him is Bhishma. So what he is speaking is audible to Bhishma also but he is going towards Drona. Raja vachina So he starts speaking. So here, why does the Gita start with this particular incident? You could say at one level it is because Duryodhana is concerned, Dhritarashtra is concerned about Duryodhana. But it's also going to depict Duryodhana's mentality. So when he sees, hey, the Pandavas have formed their military formations, their battle phalanxes in a very impressive and aggressive way. It like say one team is batting and they have scored a mountain of runs and then when the other team comes to bat sometimes the team might be demoralized if it's a t20 match and the other team has scored something like 250 or 300 runs how are we going to reach that also when the team comes out they might be very demoralized because it's such a difficult task but suppose the opposing team comes with full aggressive intent then what may happen is the the captain on the other side may just run okay you know hey they are coming such an aggressive mode maybe we have to change our fielding arrangement we have to make some change our plans so Duryodhan is surprised a little shaken also to see the sheer aggressive and impressive arrangement of the Pandava's army and thus he goes to talk with Drona and then now why to Drona See, generally speaking, it is a captain. Now, Duryodhan is not exactly the captain, he is the commander. He is the person who is de facto the king. He is, although the Trashtra is the king, actually speaking. So, in English, there are two words de facto and de officio. This is German. De officio means who is officially the king. So, the de officio, who is the king? Dhritarashtra. And de facto, who is the king? Duryodhana. So, this has happened 10, 50, 10, 12 years ago before in the Indian government. There was one person on the Prime Minister's chair and there was another person in power. <laughs> <laughs> so, this word Raja in this particular verse, it has could have both meanings Raja, Vachinam, Abhravi. 
So it is Duryodhan spoke these words with Drona or or Udra, Raja or Dhritarashtra. These were the words that were spoken. That Raja can mean both things. So it is a subtle. Di- it can also be like a subtle dig, a taunt at Dhritarashtra. You are sitting on the king's throne, but you are not really having the power. All the power is with Duryodhan, and he is going there. So Raja Vachnam Abhrahit. And then why is he going to Drona? Because he is concerned about the commitment, the loyalty of some of the people on his side. So among the people on his side, whose loyalty is Duryodhan most concerned about? Bhishma and Drona. They are both powerful, but both of them, they didn't have the heart to fight. They would much rather have avoided the war. So, how committed they are, that is the question for him. Now, especially he sees in how well the opposite side has formed the army, he sees in this an opportunity to incite Drona. Because the opposite army's commander is Drona's disciple. Who is that? Yes, Arjuna is the major commander, but Drishtadyumna. Before the war, there is a discussion. Arjuna is by far the best archer on the Pandava's side. But should Arjuna become the commander? Well, if Arjuna had wanted, he could very easily have become the commander. But they all decide that Arjuna is such a good fighter. Let him just fight. Let him not have to worry about the overall strategy and who is doing what where. So like some, some player might be a very good batsman. And if you put the make them the captain, that might detract from their performance as a batsman. So let this person just focus on batting. So like that, Arjuna was the person who was just told, just fight. Krishna was the commander. It was almost a surprise to us. That he, he was not such a great warrior. But he was made the commander. And it was Dushyadumna who had organized the army. So he is saying, Tava Shishe Nadhi Mata. So he says, that is your student who has organized it. And this student is also who? Drupada Putre. No? He is the son of your rival Drupada. So basically he is telling him, your softness has already caused this trouble. Now, don't be soft again. So, because you are soft, in what? You trained the son of your rival. And just see how he has made our work difficult. So, that's why he's taunting him. Don't be soft again. And then after that, he starts assessing both the sides. And he lists the soldiers on the opposite side. Then he lists the soldiers on his side. And through all this, now what is he trying to do? See, like some people... When something disturbing has happened, so, so they, may, they may tell someone, you know, everything, everything will be alright. Somebody can reassure us, everything will be alright, don't worry. And somebody say, everything will be alright, don't be worried. <laughs> so then he asks them, are you convincing me or are you convincing yourself? <laughs> so, so Duryodhan is both reassuring his army while also reassuring himself. So he is saying, yeah, they have many warriors on their side, but we have equal warriors and better warriors on our side. And then as he continues speaking, then he has spoken and he realizes that you know, I have been speaking to Dorona. And Bhishma may feel snubbed by this, may feel neglected, may feel disrespected. Uh, it's, it's a, there's a key player who wants to, if the coach comes or the key player comes and talks to the vice captain and doesn't talk with the captain. So he says, actually Bhish, Bhishma Meva Bhirakshantu. It has to conclude by saying that our whole army is protected by Bhishma. And he says their army is protected by Bhima. So why does he not use Dhrishtudumna? Why does he use Bhima? Because when Dhrishtudumna is the commander, 
for him bhima is the big threat so bhima is the one is they are protected by bhima so he said and he tries to say that the bhishma is so powerful aparyaptam tatasmakam so our strength is unlimited their strength is finite so here there's a there's a lot of linguistic subtleties over here but he tries to say one thing but what happens sometimes words can have multiple meanings and this is how a lot of uh, a lot of unintended humor or a word unintended um, meanings can come out of words hmm. so if somebody uses a word which has one meaning and other person takes the other meaning then okay what is going on once i was giving a, giving a program in america in uk actually in leicester and after that it was a bigger question answer session session in session in youth meeting and after that the organizer came and said the big smile on his face prabhu you killed it <laughs> said, hey, what did you what did i kill and if i kill something why are you so happy about it <laughs> now killed has a secondary meaning it comes from the hunting metaphor where a group of people would go to hunt and whoever would shoot who would actually hit the target they would everybody would congratulate you killed it so now it has just become you killed it means you did very well so this is that's getting multiple meanings so when he says aparyaptam tadasmakam balam bhishma virakshitam so when he uses this word so basically what is this aparyaptam this word comes this can mean immeasurable and that is his intention but other meaning can be insufficient the same word can have both meanings and thus the very statement that he is saying to increase the morale or oh, our strength is immeasurable our strength is insufficient <coughs> so it can have this ambivalent impact now he has a particular intention but the words he chooses they they also reflect to some extent in the nervousness and then he says okay bishwa is very powerful brothers also have to protect bishwa and then by here is all this the bishwa is a seasoned warrior you know people who are experienced you know, we may say one thing but they can understand what are emotions in our mind what are our intentions in speaking this so like somebody comes and speaks something very sweetly to us you know you know suppose somebody comes and says to a as to a wealthy person you know you know you are such a generous person you have such a large heart you have this the question is kitna paisa chahiye how much money do you want is it like you know he has not mentioned money but is understood so bhishma gets tired you know all this politicking you are doing trying to encourage this person trying to do this trying to do that inside that person just stop it and he blows his conch so when he blows his conch the, the blowing of the conch is like the indication that the war is now about to begin so in the past war was like sports although people wanted to win it was not win at all costs it was test of strength <laughs> and skill but it was as they say nowadays in not also is made the better player win or made the better team win so it was like now the hostilities are going to begin now the war is going to begin so when he blew the conch the others also started blowing their conches and there was indication from their side that the war is about to begin and it is at this point that sanjay if you consider sanjay with the camera here we have camera over here so the camera is focused on one side and the camera moves to the other side and in the camera moves to the other side let's look at that verse over here is the 14th verse tatah shvetair hayair yukte so tatah on the other side shvetair hayair hayair is horses that with with equipped with white horses tatah shvetair hayair yukte tatah shvetair hayair yukte mahati mahati is great magnificent Syandane is chariot, stato, situated on a magnificent chariot. Mahate, Mahati Syandane stato. Mahati Syandane stato. And then who is situated? 
Madhav Pandavas Chandras. The Gita is poetry. And there are many places where this poetic qualities of the Gita come out. But then Krishna and Arjuna could have used, uh, Partha and uh, Madhusudana could have used. But here the alliterative names are Madhava and Pandava. So both of them are verb, the ending is sounded there. Madhava Pandava Shaiva. These two people are there. Madhava Pandava Shaiva. Madhava Pandava Shaiva. And then Divya Ushankhau. They are they also blew their conscious, but their conscious are divine. They are extremely special. Pradat Matu. Pradat, Pradat Matu means they, they blew their conscious. Divya Ushankhau Pradat Matu. Divya Ushankhau Pradat Matu. So together. Tataha Shvetai Hare Yute Mahati Shandhane Sitao Madhava Pandava Shaiva Divya Ushankhau Pradat Matu. So here is the entry of the hero. You know, in many movies, you know, how the hero enters is often quite dramatic. Sometimes maybe the heroine is being attacked by someone, the hero comes charging on a bike. In traditional it was like a knight in shining, shining armor coming on a white horse or something like that. And nowadays in movies somebody might come jump from a helicopter. <laughs> So here it is described that the hero is Tata Shvetai, the white horses, the beautiful, spectacular horses. And then there's a magnificent chariot. And as it's being described, suddenly there's a twist in the tail. They say normally if somebody comes in a somebody the hero comes in a chauffeured car, then you would expect the chauffeur to open the door and the hero to come out. But here, the hero is actually the chauffeur. <laughs> so, Madhava Pandava Shaiva. Now, Krishna is the Supreme Lord, but his entry in the Bhagavad Gita is, it's quite disarming. Disarming means he's not coming in a huge, imposing presence. He's coming as simply the charioteer. And it's interesting over here, although he's a charioteer, it's also indicated that he is not just a charioteer. Among all the other people who blow conches are described. It's only the warriors blowing their conches are described. No other place the charioteer is blowing conches. Here Krishna is the charioteer, but he's also blowing a conch. Because he has voluntarily taken the role of a charioteer. He's still a powerful warrior. And if we consider sports, sports is a physical game, but before the physical game is also a mental game going on. You know, before a men mental game means you know each team's captain or players may say, you know, we are going to crush them completely. I am going to humiliate him, I am going to do this, I am going to do that. So you try to play with the minds of the other people. And it might not uh, it, it is just like Mentally, each team or each player will try to get the upper hand. So here it is described that the Kauravas blow their conches and the Pandavas also blow their conches. And the result is the Pandavas blowing of the conches is so formidable, it's so resonant, it is so impactful that Hridaya Nivedarayat that actually the hearts of the Kauravas they are not just demoralized, they are shattered. <coughs> so basically, the whole trajectory that is described over here, in the first few verses, the whole trajectory that is described is, the Pandavas, they are gaining the upper hand. How are they gaining the upper hand? First is, Duryodhana is shaken. Hmm? That's what is described right in the beginning. That is right from the second verse itself. Then if you come to 10th verse, there is Duryodhana's slip of tongue or whatever it is. That is basically where he ends up saying a word that can have the opposite meaning. Then if we go further, when both of them, both sides blow their conscious, then what happens is, in I think it's the 18th verse, Yes. 
शंखम तदुक नाइंटीन वर्ष सघोषो धार्त राष्ट्राण हृदयानी व्यदारयटीन वर्ष डिस्क्राइब दैट द मेन्टल गेम दैट इज गोइंग ऑन दर हार्ट्स ऑफ दि कौरवास आर शैटर्ड so overall it seems like the pandavas are gaining the upper hand the pandavas are about to win or they are moving towards the victory so it's like in a match you know a batsman comes and a batsman is batting comfortably batsman hits a boundary then batsman hits a sixer and the batsman seems to be in a very commanding position and seems to carry the match away and suddenly It's like or a full toss comes and the batsman just hits the ball to a filter, filter and the batsman gets out. So it's like they say it's like against the run of the play. It's going in the opposite direction. So it's going like this. Suddenly there's a lose turn <coughs> for the Pandavas. Everything seems to be going in favor of the Pandavas, but then something will change. So how will that change happen? That's what is described here after. So sun. So now when the conches have been blown. it is means both sides are ready to fight but when they are ready to fight sanj it seems that arjuna gets a very strange desire he says i want to see i want to see who is on the other side dhartarashtra se durbuddhe yuddhe priya chiki irshava he says i want to see who has come to assist support the wicked son of the drashtra now when he says i want to see now the obvious question may come up here what is there to see it is not that it is, there are, are there any last moment alliances formed that they have got some new warriors on their side that he wants to know it like say two teams are going to play a cricket match then you want to know you know have they made any last minute changes is there some new player in this team so i want to see is it that there is anyone new over there no that is not the case then why do they want to see exactly what is there on what is there to see actually is it that they are unknown that obviously not there they have been trying to make allies for months together so that is also not the case so what does he want to see so he what he wants to see is how intent are they to fight see this is a fratricidal fight fratricide what does it mean fathers sorry fathers families fathers like lineage Uh, lineage. Father, so side. So what does side mean? Kill. Kill side. Like we have suicide. Hmm? To kill oneself. We have patricide is to kill the father. Like that. Homicide is to kill, uh, kill oneself. Hmm? Or genocide is to kill an entire, uh, entire community. Hmm? So fa- fratricide is comes from the word. It's brothers. Like fraternal is brotherly. So this is a fight among brothers. and the pandavas don't want the fight they have tried their very best to avoid the fight and yet the fight is going to happen so he so there is a part of the pandavas just maybe this fight will not happen. they are ready for it they know it is going to happen but he wants to see how intent are they on the fight and that's why he comes in the middle so the two warriors are there and two armies are there and krishna and arjuna they come in the middle arjuna is asked arjuna asks krishna to bring in the middle and krishna does that and krishna does that krishna gets them right in the middle he gets them and arjuna arjuna krishna speaks something so what does he speak let us see bhishma drona pramukta so among all the warriors on the other side bhishma and drona are the prominent bhishma drona pramukta bhishma drona pramukta sarvesham all of them chamahikshitam they are all 
great kings, they are great warriors. Sarve Sham Chamahik Shitam. Sarve Sham Chamahik Shitam. Uacha Partha. Uacha. We spoke Partha Pasha Etan. Arjuna, see all of the warriors. You wanted to see? See all these warriors. Uacha Partha Pasha Etan. Uacha Partha Pasha Etan. Then Samaveta. Now Samaveta was the word which came in the first verse also. Samaveta Yudsava. So, Samaveta and Kuru, all the Kurus are assembled. Now the word Kuru here refers at one sense to the Kauravas who are the part of the ruling dynasty. But in one sense the Pandavas also Kuru are Kauravas, they are in the same dynasty. So, Uvacha Partha Pashyaitan, Uvacha Partha Pashyaitan, Samaveta and Kuru Niti, Samaveta and Kuru Niti. So all of them are assembled, let's recite this together once. Bhishma Krona Pramukta Sarve Sham Chamanikshitam Uvacha Partha Pashyaitan Samavetan Guru Niti So, here Arjuna is wanted to see and Krishna is saying just see, behold. Now you will see over here the word Pashya comes in several verses. The idea of seeing. Arjuna speaks and he first says in that Yavad etan nirikshayam by which I will be able to see ikshay nirikshayam means I will be able to see systematically and then that's the 21st verse then 36th word yodsamanan avekshayam I want to see I will be able to see then then Krishna says see path pashyetan and then after that what happens is Tatra Apashat Pashya I'll see again. So in this particular phase, this the idea of seeing is tan samiksha sakonte. So before Krishna says Pashya, Arjuna talks about seeing twice, and then after that, Sanjay's narrating also talks about seeing. So here what is being what is signified by using the same word again and again? So, is it that Krishna or the same idea is being talked again and again? Sometimes in different words, sometimes in the same word. So, this, the point is that here this seeing hmm, has an impact. And the impact of the seeing is that it becomes confusing for him. He gets confused. His vision, what he sees, it vision, it steals away his determination. So he has come with a particular determination, but his determination goes down. So Bhishma Drona Pramukta. Now among all the warriors, the two warriors against whom Arjuna has absolutely no desire to fight, those are Bhishma and Drona. They are his venerable elders. So they are the people with whose encouragement and blessings and guidance he has actually learned to fight. And now he has to fight against them. Yes. When he sees them assembled and they are warriors, although it's a difficult duty, they are ready for their duty. And when they are, he sees them ready to fight, he just becomes overwhelmed. So I think, how can I fight with them? And he starts pouring out his heart in confusion and despair. This is just something I do not want to do. And what, what has happened to him? He's basically thinking that if I fight against them, what am I fighting for? What is it that exactly I am saying? He says, these are a whole, not just one generation. He will list, then eventually, there are multiple generations from grandfathers to fathers to his peers, to his sons, to his grandsons. All those are assembled over there. Now, Arjuna has fought against this army before. Recently only. When was that? <laughs> so now, interestingly, when he had fought at Virat, 
the generally in a war there are the odds odds means how likely is it to win so in virat the odds were actually tougher and arjun was all alone over there and the entire kaurava army was there so the odds were tougher on that time and at that time arjuna does not become sentimental arjuna is not overwhelmed by confusion or hesitation emotion in general but now arjuna is overwhelmed why is that that is because the stakes there were lower stakes means what is at stake so in that war arjuna had no desire to kill any of them arjuna just wanted to stop them he wanted to protect them they had attacked the virat king you know and arjuna wanted to protect them so he also wanted to show them his strength by which they would understand that <coughs> the pandavas cannot just be walked over they cannot be neglected they are a force to be reckoned with but the idea is just show them the power and hopefully they will come to a peaceful uh, so peaceful negoti- negotiating table a reconciliation will happen but now when the war was going to happen one side was not going to go back alive and therefore the stakes were much higher it like say two teams say which is a india and australia meet in the league stages in a world cup and maybe some of indian players are resting or some of indian players are tricky players are injured in the stakes the odds may be tougher but okay it's just a league stage match stage match even if you lose it's no big deal but say the two teams meet in the finals and then the stakes become much higher at that so like that here the stakes are immensely high and thus arjuna feels torn and when he feels torn so what is his concern what is his fear he gives a series of verses but let's look at some key verses which show his his concern so he says he lists out all the warriors are there so among the various warriors he says look at some of the verses okay let's first go back to another verse स्वजनम आहवे in this particular battlefield we kill our own people hatva swajanam ahave hatva swajanam ahave na kaankshe the obvious purpose of fighting is to win a kingdom he said na kaankshe vijayam krishna o oh, krishna i do not desire i do not desire a kingdom na kaankshe vijayam krishna na kaankshe vijayam krishna na cha rajyam or in the kingdom sukhani okay now the pandavas have lived in the forest they are they are royalty and for them to live in a forest has been a great austerity they done that actually they would want royal comforts back is it but this killing our own relatives it's just not worth it nachara nacharajyam sukhani cha nacharajyam sukhani cha and now on one side he is saying you know, i don't desire the happiness but he also next he said that if we fight actually papa me va shreya dasma that will be sinful for us 
to kill all of them. They are. They, why should I be sinful? Because Sojana, they are our relatives. And you say that part, you know, they, if you don't kill them, they are, they are greedy. It's okay. They are greedy. But then, they are greedy for a kingdom. And that's why they want to fight. But now, if we want to fight, then how are we any better than them? We are also greedy. And the difference is that greed has closed their eyes. But just because greed has closed their eyes, why should I let greed close my eyes? You know, I can see that the cost of this will be terrible. And then he uses the term Kula Dharma. He says, this is our dynasty. Protecting our dynasty is so important. How can I go about causing destruction of my dynasty? <coughs> so many times people think that Arjuna just became cowardly. But Arjuna absolutely has not become cowardly. Because in all the reasons that Arjuna gives, not once does he mention fear of his own death. Not even once. So there is fear, no doubt. Arjuna has fear. If we see, he, the emotion that he is going through is, he says that my hair are standing, my limbs are trembling, my skin is burning, my bow is slipping. So all of this indicates that he is surely overwhelmed by emotion. And from there, the emotion that he is, the fear at one level is overwhelming for him. Hmm? But what is the cause of the fear? It is not his own death. He is not afraid of death. His fear is of wrongdoing. He says this fight itself may be the wrong thing to do. And if I do something wrong, <laughs> the consequences will be disastrous. It's like in a pandemic. Suppose there is a, a doctor who has been appointed to save the patients. And say maybe there is the Prime Minister of the country who is mortally sick. And that Prime Minister is also severely infected. Now treating the Prime Minister could mean the doctor might get the infection. Now, that could be one reason for hesitation. You know, I don't want to treat it. The other could be, this is a very critical case. And maybe, I don't know how to treat it. I don't know what treatment to give. And if I do something wrong, then the country will lose its leader. What might be the consequence of that? Maybe riots will broke out. Maybe unscrupulous elements will take advantage. Maybe enemies will attack. So, he is, if a doctor, a doctor has fear of treating um, infected patient, he is a prime minister. Now, it could be fear of being infected. That is one fear, but the other fear is the fear of giving wrong treatment. So now are both fears the same? Not at all. The first is a very self-concerned fear, self-centered fear. The second is the fear that comes from being responsible. Sometimes the uh, sometimes people give seminars how to conquer your fears how to become free from all fear if a person is free from all fear the person around people around them should be full of all fear <laughs> <laughs> See, fear it is actually a natural protector at one level if I'm a, if somebody is driving uh, driving a car and they say, I have no fear of any accident. <laughs> then people in the car say, we have too much fear, we'll get out right now. <laughs> so, yes, we should not be conquered by our fears. We should not let our fear control us. But fear is 
a natural psychological mechanism that alerts us to danger so sometimes the more responsible a person is the more fear they may have because they are aware of the responsibility one of my friends is a pilot and he tells me that every time he, he loves flying planes he said since my childhood that was my aspiration but he says every time i have to fly it's exciting but it's also a great responsibility now if i make a mistake now of course there are a lot of um, machines warning and supporting and there's a co-pilot and everything but still if i make a mistake oh people would lose their lives so this is a fear coming from being responsible so it is arjuna's fear is coming because he is responsible and this first chapter of the bhagavad gita actually <laughs> describes how arjuna is qualified to gain the knowledge of the gita because he is not just impulsively rushing rushing into actions he is thinking am i doing the right thing he is saying he is contemplating and is articulating that maybe what i am doing is not the right thing nuche shreya on pashyami maybe this is not the long term good and that concern for the long term good shows the caliber of arjuna and such a person who is thoughtful who is responsible who is inquisitive at such a time who is contemplative who is going to ask questions such a person is actually ready to receive the knowledge of the bhagavad gita so arjuna is responsible that's what makes him reflective reflective means he is reflecting he is thinking and because he is reflective now sometimes when you think too much it can make a person confused hmm? but sometimes a person when they think too much that can also lead them hmm, to a deeper understanding so you know there is a thin line between overthinking and deep thinking isn't it <laughs> so in both there is actually a person is thinking and is thinking in both cases you could say there is thinking more than usual now but you could say the overthinking is negative deep thinking is positive so the gita will actually take arjuna in chapter 1 arjuna is doing in some ways is thinking but his thinking is going towards overthinking so the difference between overthinking and deep thinking is one key difference is overthinking just keeps going round and round and round and round it gets nowhere it just but deep thinking it goes deeper and deeper so deep overthinking is basically uh, it is pointless or aimless it is deep thinking is directed it is overthinking is directionless so it just goes round and round and round so arjuna's thinking right now is going round and round and that is not good but still the fact that he is thinking that is good that is laudable and now as arjuna is thinking we come to the last verse in the series so what is arjuna's essential dilemma over here that will be articulated towards the end so utsanna utsanna means one who destroys kul dharmanam the duty of the dynasty or duty towards the dynasty 
उत्सन्न कुल धर्माणा इज दैट ह्यूमन बींग हुएवर इट मे बी जनार्दन ओ कृष्ण मनुष्याणाम जनार्दन जनार्दन नरके इज हेल नियतम कॉन्स्टंटली परपेचुअली वासो अच्छे पर्सन विल गो फॉर एवर टू हेल नरके नियतम वासो नरके नियतम वासो भवतीति भवतीति दिस इज व्हाट विल हैपन टू अ पर्सन अनुशुष्युम आई हैव हर्ड दिस फ्रॉम अथॉरिटीज फ्रॉम ग्रेट सोल्स so arjun is trying to find he is thinking himself but he is also trying to find guidance for his thinking by th- by resorting to thinkers he says those those are thoughtful people those are sages from them i have heard they say that if somebody destroys the dynasty that person will go to hell bhavati tyanushushruma bhavati tyanushushruma together अर्जुन बिटवीन टू ड्यूटी टू धर्म वन धर्म केम टू फाइट वॉज द क्षत्रिय धर्म as a warrior he has to fight but now he is also reminded very forcefully of his kula dharma his duty to his dynasty and does he stop should i do my professional duty or should i do my dynasty duty my family duty which one is more so imagine if there's a doctor and doctor has a critically ill patient who needs an organ transplant now that person is a very important person and they need organ transplant if they get the organ transplant they'll be safe and wherever an organ is available the doctor should get that organ but imagine at that same time the doctor's son has met with a lethal accident and they may die or not die it's likely but you don't know is he going to die and then that organ can go to this person <laughs> so now should the doctor take away the life support from the son so that they can give the organ to that other person now we say that oh this for the sun has been so critically met with an accident that the chances of survival are practically zero but still like is my son i would like my son to live for as long as possible to try to keep the life support as long as possible if i take out the life support it's like i am killing that person so the professional duty says that say uh, save this patient maybe that patient's likelihood of being saved is very high but if that patient doesn't get the uh, organ okay that's bad but if to give that patient the organ i have to remove life support from here so in one sense you could say here both of them are critically ill but there are high survival chances here hmm and here there are for the sun low survival chances but still it's not an easy decision so arjuna feels that how can i fight over here <coughs> if i if i fight i'm going to kill my own relatives yes i'm a warrior i'm meant to fight but but these are my own people now of course another part of arjuna knows that just because i don't fight this is mean the war is going to get over i may not want to fight but the karmas are not likely to stop fighting mm-hmm. even if we just give up our claim to the kingdom the kauravas will still chase us and attack us in the forest and then will i not protect my own family i may be ready to die also 
but will I be ready to see my own brothers and my wife being killed? Yes. Or even if I, even they don't persecute me, there are so many warriors who have come to support us. The Kauravas will try to settle, try to persecute them. You chose the opposite side. Like in a political party, you know, if say the two political parties are then uh, in an election and say one party wins and they try to find out who support, who gave funds to the other political party. Now we will teach you a lesson. You supported them, so oh, they will get after, they will go after our allies. Can I, can I watch that happening? So basically, for him, he sees how horrible fighting will be. On the other side, he says, not fighting, there's also no real solution. So he becomes so overwhelmed that he just puts aside his book. Visrujya sasharam japam shoka samvigna manasaha So the chapter ends with Arjuna putting aside his book. Arjuna saying, he basically says, I won't fight. But it's more, I just don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do. And this Arjuna's bow actually it represents our determination. You know, life can put all of us in situations where we lose our determination. And at the start of the Gita, Arjuna's bow is lowered. By the end of the Gita, Arjuna's bow will be raised once again. And the Gita helps Arjuna regain his vision, regain his determination, regain his enthusiasm. And similarly for all of us, life's perplexities may just discourage us, may make us want to put aside our bow. But if we understand the message of the Gita, we all can be inspired to raise our bow in readiness to fight. So how that happens, how the Gita gives such a morale boosting message, that we'll discuss over our future sessions. So I'll summarize what we discussed today. Broadly, in this chapter one overview that we did, we discussed, we started with discussing of 1.1, we discussed how the significance of the word dharma. That is, the question over there is, what influence is it going to have? Mm. That's why he asked, the, at the dharma kshetra, what happened? So it's a self-evident question, but it's not actually a self-evident question. There's something deeper going on. And what it shows uh, from 1.2 to 11 is, that there is no influence on Duryodhan. That Duryodhan continues to be his normal politicking self. Although he is shaken, but he tries to cover it up and he continues politicking. You know, inside this person, speak this way to that person, try to go to that person. So, Dharma has no effect over there. But then, what happens, we discuss this, that in 1.14, we discuss Krishna's entry. And over here, all that is going on is, basically, the Pandavas are seem to be getting a upper hand. The, the way things are moving is that first Duryodhan was shaken, then he had a slip of tongue. He spoke some then what happened was that their hearts were shattered and the conscious were blown. So overall things seem to be going in a particular way. But then Suddenly something happens. What is that? Actually, Dharma has an influence on Arjuna. The place of Dharma does not cause any rethinking for Duryodhana, but it causes rethinking for Arjuna. So Arjuna sees. And after sees, what happens is he feels. He feels fear. He feels fear, but the fear is not of 
death. It is a feel of fear of wrongdoing. So we discuss how here Arjuna is he is actually responsible and he is reflective. So these are his qualifications that have been demonstrated for receiving the Gita. He will be able to receive the knowledge of the Gita because he is responsible and reflective. We discussed the responsible means like a doctor worried what I should do, what I should not do. Or that. Not because the doctor is afraid of catching the infection, but doctor worried that I may not be able to treat the important person properly. Then we discuss what was Arjuna's dilemma. Dilemma was two duties were pulling him in opposite directions. One was his Kshatriya Dharma, which he had come ready to do, that is, I will fight. Other was his Kula Dharma. How can I fight against my relatives? And he just felt torn. And then, lastly, we discussed how eventually that Arjuna, who is demoralized, Arjuna's Gandiva, it is bow, it is lowered, but by the Gita's message, it will become raised. So, same way, I mean, we started by discussing how the Gita is a three level conversation. So, it is a Krishna Arjuna conversation. Sanjay Dhritarashtra conversation and it is a Paramatma and Atma conversation. So at this level, we all can also become energized, enthused, enlightened by the Gita. And this is in fact the timeless objective of the Gita. But when we feel overwhelmed, when we feel confused, how can we elevate ourselves? So, I have written a small poem which describes Arjuna's plight in chapter 1 of the Gita. So, I will read this out. So, Arjuna is feeling, how, how can I fight and kill those whose pleasure is my heart's will? A kingdom is worth no more than mere mud if it's got at the cost of their blood. Killing them will make the, this world into hell. And send me a wild killer to eternal hell. Better I live penniless or die defenseless than fight for a greed that makes me heartless. Fighting this war is a thing never to do. Fighting this war is the only thing to do. So shout two parts of me with much ado. I don't know, I just don't know what to do. Should we take it tomorrow? We'll take a few questions. How many? Yes, the mic. Yeah. Yes, please. I could understand. Like, uh, how Arjun is very well qualified for receiving Gita's knowledge. Like, he didn't thought about all this before. Like, there were months of preparations and on. He's just thinking, like, at the right moment. Now it's time to fight. Everything is prepared, everything is at its peak. Yeah. Now he's thinking about it. So it's oh he's like very well qualified for no, it's okay. It is not that they had not thought about this. Before the this is the Vishnu Parva. Before that there are two parvas, mainly the Udyoga Parva. So in the Udyoga Parva, the Pandavas are doing two things. They are gaining allies for the fight and they are trying to do peace negotiations to avoid the fight. And there is that deliberation happening. So this whole point of Kula Dharma and Kshatriya Dharma, these two duties, Yudhishthir talks about it, Krishna talks about it. That's why there is a lot of hesitation and deliberation. But this comes at a flash point. That when the actual war is about to happen, these questions come with a far more crushing impact. It's when the actual situation comes, the gravity of it becomes much more real. Like say, 
somebody has to become a surgeon then you have to actually cut open a human cadaver a human body now is it yeah i can cut it it's I mean, actually when you see a human body even if it is dead you start cutting it at that time it's not easy so arjuna has thought about this earlier but now in the gravity the immensity of the situation comes upon him it all registers with far greater force so all the previous thinking that had happened has now become much much more real <coughs> Yeah. Uh, you said that uh, there are different meanings to our like Sanskrit words are different meanings to it. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we know that what uh, meaning that uh, what meaning we have to choose? What meaning that particular context? Yes. So meanings are determined in general. This is the universal principle language. There is content and there is context. We look at what is being said, and we look at where it is being said, and based on that we learn. So that is why we cannot just use a dictionary. Somebody has to actually understand that language. You can't just look at a dictionary, look at this word, look at that word. So not only understand the language, you have to understand the subject. You have to understand the world view over there. So basically, to understand it. First of all, language is important, but beyond language, there is subject. Just like say, uh, suppose there is some very important book on physics that is in English, and say it is to be translated into Hindi. So, just because somebody knows English very well, can they translate that book? Yeah, knowledge of English is necessary, but you need something much more, isn't it? Because Physics is subject in itself. So first, language of English is required. Then, language of the so knowledge of the knowledge of the language is required. Then, knowledge of the subject is required. Then, after that, it is best if there is knowledge of the author also, because each author speaks in a particular way, writes in a particular way. So that's why to understand the Gita, one needs knowledge of Sanskrit. One needs knowledge of the philosophy of those times, and one needs knowledge of the speaker Krishna. When all these three are there, then that person is actually qualified to properly understand and explain the Gita. That's why the Gita has a commentary tradition, and a person who has who doesn't uh, come as a part of the commentary commentary tradition, that means the tradition of commentators, they may write something on the Gita. A Prabhupada would say often that such such translations of the Gita, they are not Bhagavad Gita as it is. They are Bhagavad Gita as you are. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we bring our own conceptions into Gita. Yes, please. Okay, the mic is here. Can you hear first? Go. Give it here, Prabhu. <coughs> Hare Krishna Prabhu, uh, first thank you for giving such an interesting explanation on the first chapter. Uh, like my doubt is regarding the overall discussion of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, like um, if a friend uh, if a friend asks from his friend about the uh, how to play cricket, he will answer about that topic. But uh, in Gita we see that uh, he uh, the confusion uh, in Arjun's mind is regarding his dharma. But Krishna has answered other things also, like uh, karma yoga and bhakti yoga and all other stuff. Like uh, the other friend is giving the rules of cricket and tennis, golf, geography, history, all things, other things also. Yes. So, uh, so how is this explainable? Good point. So, so I'm going to come in tomorrow's session, but we have mentioned over here. See, in two, any book, you know, it has. Every every book, any every narrative, say even a movie, if it is there. There is something which is specific, and there is something which is universal. So if you consider any movie, the movie might be how a hero, this hero met this heroine, how they did this, how they did that. But there are some universal themes. There could be class differences between wealthy and poor. There could be caste differences. There could be the movie could be about uh, uh, maybe. Geographical distances that you know one person has to go for another country, 
there are universal themes that are there so generally speaking in a story the universal themes are addressed somewhat indirectly the focus on the specific characters but sometimes those characters may have discussions directly where the universal themes come up so when arjuna asks a question in 2.7 it is this question he does he asks what is dharma he does not ask should i fight arjuna would ask the question at three levels he could have asked should i fight <laughs> he could have asked what is my dharma but what he asks is simply what is dharma <coughs> so he is himself asking the question at a very universal level and so the specific is the battle but the universal theme is the right thing to do and the gita speaks at that level because arjuna himself raises the question at that level if the gita had simply spoken about you know should arjuna fight should i not fight then that book would have been of interest only to people who are what we call as history buffs you know those are interested in some historical battle that had happened sometime <laughs> the gita has become a book of universal relevance because it addresses issues at a universal level Yes, please. So, Ujjain, between you told that uh, there was a moment when Duryodhana's uh, tongue slipped. So, what was that point? That same verse, aparyaptam dasmaakam. So, when he uses the word aparyaptam, he intends it to be immeasurable, but the word can also have the meaning insufficient. So, now which meaning will be taken? So, that's that's the problem. So, that in that sense, it's a slip of tongue from his side. Yes, please. Yeah, we we'll come back to you. Never mind. You ask one question. We we'll come back to you. Yeah. That's all. So you are asking the difference between overthinking and deep thinking. So my question is that whenever we are in a situation, so we tend to think, but we cannot be sure that I am overthinking or I am deep thinking. So how can we properly identify those situations? That if I am overthinking or if I am thinking the right direct right direction, so see generally speaking, a thinking is not very linear, but broadly speaking, so if we can say, if there is time in thinking and there is clarity in thinking. <coughs> so generally speaking when we think more we'll get greater clarity but after some time we will hit a plateau we think more we don't get any and after some time the more we think the more we get <laughs> so now it is it may be possible that there is further clarity also to be got but that means we have hit the limits of our thinking so if you have to think further we have to consult someone else so basically uh, the test is whether my thinking is increasing my clarity or decreasing my clarity mm. so the clarity does not necessarily mean certainty <coughs> life is sometimes so complex that we may get clarity but we may never get certainty or we may not uh, uh, its certainty is less likely but even if we get greater clarity that's good so even if we don't have a clear answer what to do we just get a clearer understanding of what all is at stake so sometimes i am confused and i am confused why i am confused is it but i am confused and i am clear why i am confused that is a better state to be okay this issue is here this issue is here and these two options i am not able to decide which option to take so that we might at least get greater clarity then if the clarity is increasing it's it's deep thinking yes please can continue prabhu duryodhan has duryodhan uh, called duryodhan shekan even he have the narayan sena well he was shaken because he came into the battle very over confident in fact the previous night before the war started he sent shakuni's son 
to incite to to provoke the pandavas he thought that you know i have got such a big army that i want to crush them and it won't be even a fight it won't be much fun he said if i anger them a little bit then there will be some fun in fight so he basically sent a messenger and in that message he inserted everyone he said bhima you think you are so powerful i reduce you to a mere cook hmm and arjun you think you are so powerful because of me you became a eunuch and he basically systematically inserted everyone and now this was an insulting message that he sent shakuni san shakuni san said first of all you know Please remember that a messenger should never be punished. That is not my words. <laughs> I am only conveying a message. <laughs> so he was so overconfident that this is going to be just a cakewalk. But when he saw how confident the Pandavas were, how well prepared they were, so he realized. See, although on one side he had an ego that I am going to be easy, but still he was a warrior. and he could make out you know this these are these are not going to cave in very easily it like say somebody is a somebody is a trained martial martial fight martial art trained martial arts and that person sees maybe they are they are attacked by four five gundas now thugs they are attacking now that person can make out like some people this person is really he is a trained fighter this person may be hefty but this person has no fighting just by their posture just by their movements you can understand a little bit So while Duryodhan had that arrogance, but still he was shaken. Hey, I didn't expect them to be so well prepared to fight. So that was the shit. Yes, please. Please use mic. Please you said that uh, Arjuna uh, is qualified by because his response his response was in reflective. What does it mean reflective? Reflect reflection. Reflection means thinking, deep thinking. So reflective means one who is doing deep thinking. So he is aware of his responsibility. That's responsible, and he is thinking deeply about how well I can, ex- how how can I execute my responsibility properly. So in that sense, he is reflective. Thank you. Just follow up on that. Yeah. <coughs> uh, like, are there any other qualities of Arjuna that the made him? Um, worthy like uh, of receiving the knowledge of yes of course see, we are looking at it from the linear textual context as it is revealed in this particular chapter this particular chapter but beyond that we know krishna himself will say later in the fourth chapter so eva yam maya tedya that i want to speak this knowledge to you in 4.3 says because bhakto si me sakha chite you are my devotee you are my friend so when arjuna was born You know, Pandu. He was seeking different children, so he first said that I need a successor. So he said, I want a son who will be who will be dedicated to dharma. And he got Yudhishthir. But then he thought it's good to have a son dedicated to dharma, but dharma cannot be protected unless there is bala. So he said, give me a son with great bala. Whom did he get by that? Bhima. And then he thought deeply that. Yes, dharma, bala, all these are important, but ultimately, bhakti is the most important thing. So he said, "I want a son who will be a great bhakti." And then he got Arjuna. So Arjuna's devotion is an important qualification. However, the Gita, in its narrative in the first chapter, does not focus on that. Thank you. So the last question. स्टोरी दैट ही कुड नॉट बिकॉज ऑफ अ कर्स Pandu could not have a son himself. So the gods, various gods came and through the there is a ritual called niyoga. Niyoga means that if a woman, for whatever reason, if her husband is dead or whatever reason, the husband is not able to get a child, then some other respectable male 
can come and beget a child, but that child is considered to be the member of that dynasty, not that man, and that man alone should not have anything to do with afterwards. So that's how they had these three children, and in this case, Kunti had a benediction by which she could ask for the devtas. So she asked for three, and then Pandu wanted more, but Kunti said that in according shastra, that this yoga is an exception, and you can say. Generally, if somebody is a king, they need a heir. You know, heir is the successor, and they may need a spare. And spare means if something happens to the heir, you have a spare. Then, <laughs> now you can have a spare, spare also, a third child. But he says this is not a provision to be misused. So they say that yoga should not be used more than three times. So Kunti quotes that, and Pandu agrees. But then after that, as Kunti's children are going on, Pandu has another wife, Madri, and she feels this great sense of emptiness. I don't have any children at all. So she approaches Pandu, and she expands out her heart to him, and he says. It's the Pandu. Madri says that you know, if I request Kunti, won't listen. But you please tell. And then when he tells, Kunti agrees. And Madri thinks that uh, you know I may not get many chances from Kunti. So she calls the Ashwini Kumaras, who are twin brothers. And she gets two sons. And Kunti says what she asks. He says, if she asks for two more, he will have more children than me. He says no more after this. So the two children who he has Nakul and Sahadev, they are more from uh, Matri's desire. So at that time, Pandu doesn't ask for specific qualities over there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Shri <coughs> Krishna Bhagwan ki. Yeah. Shri Mad Bhagwat Gita ki. Yeah. Shri Prabhupada ki. Yeah. Gaur Bhakta Vrind ki. Yeah. Gaur Sri Mad. Yeah.